And I think that when we stop thinking of Jesus Christ as Lord or we just fail to live that way, well, now there's no rules and I can kind of do whatever seems right and whatever is convenient for me. And that's why we see a lot of nonsense, especially nonsense that we see in the church. Well, hello and welcome to Sunday morning with Hope Valley Church. I'm Pastor Sam. I'm the lead pastor here at Hope Valley. And today we're in part five of our series uh, of the study of the book of Acts. We're going verse by verse through the book of Acts. And today we're wrapping up chapter two. We're going to be in verses 41 through 47. Uh, and we just got done last week really kind of unpacking and examining uh, the, 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 the sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Um, and so let me just give you some introductory, some background information to get us caught up with where we're going to find ourselves in the book of Acts today. Right, so many of the Jews who heard Peter's sermon, uh, which we covered in part four of the series just last week, uh, many of the Jews who heard Peter's sermon and believed were not from Jerusalem, right? Uh, and we'll see here that about 3,000 people were saved. Um, some of those people were, you know, native to the area and lived in Jerusalem. But as we saw, many of those people were not. They were visiting from other parts of the known world at the time. And so upon being saved and really coming into the church, uh, they formed a community and didn't all go back to their hometowns, right? And so this meant that within the group of new believers, really not everyone had the same access to housing and money and their other belongings. So you would have had people that probably had homes nearby or even in Jerusalem directly, uh, but you probably had some people who, you know, they got saved, they, they're, they're all excited, right? They've joined this community of believers, and they're not ready to go back to all these different areas that we saw that the people were from. And so um, not everybody had all the access to all the same things. And so there's some practical uh, needs that, that, that had to be met. And so we're going to unpack that a little bit today as we read verse 41 through 47. Okay, and as we read uh, this, uh, chapter 2, uh, we're going to ask this question. I just want you to have this question really in the back of your minds as we go through uh, these you know, six verses. And that question is, what should the church look like? Right? What should church look like? Um, I know it's a really broad question, and that's kind of intentional. So let's just kind of have that question in the back of our minds as we go through. So I'm going to pick up here, Acts chapter 2, verse 41, says... So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved." All right, so really a short, simple passage, but I would like to take some time now. We're going to kind of unpack some of the things that we saw there, right? Because here in verse 42, it says they were, they were devoting themselves, uh, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. So we see that the new believers, right, these people who immediately believed in Jesus, um, received the gospel, submitted their hearts to him, they got baptized, and they're immediately focused Immediately, they're focused on growing in the Lord together. That's kind of the simplest way to label what we see here in, the, in this verse, right? Because they're diligently listened and learned the teachings of Jesus. Uh, what we would call today, you know, like the meaning of the scriptures and, and even things like theology and doctrine, right? The apostles are teaching them to have a deeper understanding of, of the gospel, of Jesus, how it applies in their life, right? They're devoting themselves to the teachings of the apostles. So they're actively learning the things of God. And they're focused and they're dedicated to continual prayer, but also to fellowship, just being 
with one another, right? Be it through having communion together or just having meal time together. They were doing really all of those things, right? And so the new believers immediately focused on growing in the Lord together. And we see this idea really picked up uh, later in the letter to the Hebrews, uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, let me read where it says, it says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near, right? Uh, so later on in the, book, in the book of Hebrews, right? Like in, in some of the letters from the apostles, right? There's a continual encouragement to do what we see the believers immediately doing here in chapter two, which is growing in the Lord together, stirring one another up, encouraging one another, all of those things. Uh, next thing we see is that the believers, uh, these new believers, they formed a community where they cared for one another's needs. And we see this in verse 44, it says, and all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. So we see that they're, they're not greedy, right? Uh, they're not selfish. Uh, they're not even concerned with having the same things everyone else had, right? They can have this like childish sense of fairness, right? And what I mean by that is you don't, you don't see them going, well, we're all, we're going to make sure everyone sells everything. And then we're going to make sure everyone has the exact same amount as everybody else. That's actually not what it says that they dig. It says they sold what they had and they distributed it according to people's needs, which means there was not an equal distribution. There was a distribution based on the practical needs of the people in their community, right? So some people who had a lot probably didn't have anything given to them because they didn't need anything given to them. And some people had nothing and they needed a lot, right? And so it's just a really practical approach of saying, listen, we're caring not only for the spiritual needs, which is what we saw in verse 42, but we're also caring for the material needs, right? They were focused on material needs just as much as on spiritual needs. And we actually see here, if, if we're looking, uh, when, when Paul later on, you know, several decades later, is writing to the church in Galatia, in verse uh, 10 of chapter 6 of that letter, he says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those of the household of faith. In other words, to other believers brothers and sisters in our church community, right? And so this is a really big point, right? They're, they're focused on spiritual needs, clearly focused on spiritual needs, right? They're devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. They're devoting themselves to prayer, to communion, to eating meals together, to fellowship. But they're also devoted to the practical material needs that exist within their community as well, all right? Uh, and let's pick up here, let's, we'll close up here actually in verse uh, 46 and 47. It says, day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved, right? So they were faithful, they were consistent, and they were generous, and they were grateful, right? We, we see really all those things happening. They were faithful, consistent, generous, and grateful as a result of that attitude, their approach to community and life. God was blessing them, their numbers were growing, and they had a good reputation in the city, right? And this kind of picks up uh, this idea again in Paul's letter to the Galatians, right? When he's talking about the fruit of the Spirit, he says, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. This is in verse 22, uh, Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But against these things, there's no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, right? So in other words, in the church community, there's no room for ego. There's no room for pride. There's no room for selfishness. There's no room for it, right? Because those who have who have submitted themselves to Jesus, those who belong to Jesus, they've, they've crucified those passions and those desires. And instead, they're loving and peaceful and patient and kind and generous and all these things. And, he, and, and I love this in verse 23. He says, right, against such things, there's no law. In other words, Paul's saying, no one has a problem 
with any of those behaviors, right? And that's what we see here in verse 47 of Acts 2. It says they were praising God and they were having favor with all the people. In other words, everyone around them liked them. It's the simplest way to think of that, right? Why? Because it's really hard to think badly about a group of Christians who is doing nothing but caring for one another, spending time together, and making sure nobody is going without, making sure everyone's being prayed with, prayed for, everyone's learning, everyone's growing, everyone's maturing. That community approach to discipleship and following Jesus together is something that it's really hard to raise an issue with, right? I mean, when's the last time you heard somebody go, man, I can't stand that person. They're just so kind and generous, and they're super forgiving. Ah, oh, they're the worst right? Like no one's ever said that, right? That's why Paul's saying there's no law against these things. And so we see that we see that corollary. But I want to kind of tie in an idea here, right? Because in the last lesson, right, we saw that, that Peter's message of the gospel really focused on the lordship of Jesus. And we have to see how people receiving Jesus as lord and ruler of their life has the direct result when, like when we really receive him that way and we really begin to follow him and live the way that he has, is guiding us to live, uh, it really is going to have the result of this kind of community. And I love this quote by John Stott. He says that the secret of good relationships in the Christian community is the recognition that Jesus Christ is Lord and that Christians live unto him. And so a commitment to unity and mutual care really is a direct product of submitting ourselves to God's leadership of our church family, right? So if we think about Christian community as our church family, and that's a term that people use a lot in the church, right? Oh, that's my church family. Okay, well, if we want to think of church as a family, which I would say is a good way to think of church, then we also want to recognize that, okay, well, who's the head of that household, right? Uh, it's not me as the senior pastor uh, or any other senior pastor or bishop or whatever you may have in your church structure. No, the head of the household is God, right? And so if we see God as the head of the household of our family, that is going to result in us treating one another well, caring for one another's needs, and walking obedience to do the things that he's called us to do and live the way that he's called us to live. So that quote by John Stock is 100% on point. I love the way he phrases it, right? The secret of good relationships. That secret of good relationships in the church is the recognition that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I think that when we stop thinking of Jesus Christ as Lord or when we just fail to, to live that way, well, now there's no rules and I can kind of do whatever seems right and whatever is convenient for me. And that's why we see a lot of nonsense, especially nonsense that we see in the church, right? Um, really, all human nonsense comes from a lack of recognizing Jesus Christ as king. And so uh, that's really evident in the world where people ha don't receive Jesus as king. Um, but it ought to be really evident in the church where we claim to receive Jesus Christ as king, but we have to challenge ourselves and really judge ourselves. Am I actually living like that's true? Am I actually treating Jesus like my king? Or am I living my life and conducting my behavior as a person who gets to set my own rules and boundaries, right? Uh, so now we're gonna go into the application part, right? So we've kind of broken down, we've examined what is being said, what is being communicated in Acts chapter 2, 41 through 47. But now we're gonna look at, you know, so what? Like, how does that apply? What does that mean for us right now? And so the three questions, again, every week I'm invite you to consider these three questions. And the questions are, what are the big ideas that you see in this passage? How do these ideas apply in your life? And what is your next step, right? Really, every time you study the scripture, you need to be asking yourself these questions. And so let me give you my answers as I was just thinking through those same questions myself as I was reading this passage, right? Um, you know, the big idea that I see in there is that the church is meant to address both spiritual and material needs in the community, and especially in the community of the church, right? I, I, I would argue that we should be addressing spiritual and material needs throughout our community as a whole, and especially in the church, right? That's actually what Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Uh, the other big idea 
that I see here is that there's no room. There is no room for selfishness, pride, or ego in Christian community. And uh, maybe you hear that and you chuckle, you're like, oh man, well, it seems like there's plenty of room to me, right? Uh, and, and I'm sure, you know, we could chuckle and maybe some of us aren't chuckling and uh, we're not laughing at all. We don't think it's funny at all because we've seen a lot of pride and ego and selfishness in the church. Um, and I know that we've seen that. Uh, but the two things I would say is, one, I know we've seen it, but we have to recognize it's wrong and we have to call it out as wrong. Two, before we look forward in other people, we need to look forward in ourselves. Right? It's so easy for me to look and go, that guy, that pastor, that person, whoever, oh, they're so selfish, they're so prideful, they have so much ego. That's easy to do, and, sh and we should do it, okay? Like, we need to call that stuff out. But that's step two. Step one is, where am I being selfish? Where am I being prideful? How, how do I have an ego problem? Because each of us probably do. And so we need to, right, we need to do that, as, as Paul writes to the Corinthians, we have to judge ourselves, right? We have to judge ourselves. So those are some of the big ideas. And, and as I think about how those apply in my life, you know, the first thought I have here is that I have to love people as whole people, right? Meaning I have to consider all of their needs and not just the ones that are convenient for me to meet. Right? I'm talking about myself, right? Because frankly, sometimes I see a need and I'm like, that's too inconvenient. I don't want to worry about that person's need. Maybe somebody else will take care of it. Uh, but when I do that, I'm not really loving the person as a whole person. I'm only loving parts of them. I'm only loving the parts of them that are not inconvenient for me to love. And so the application I see here is that I need to love people as whole people. That's what we saw the new believers doing with one another. They were loving each other as whole people. They were looking at all of one another's needs and not just some of one another's needs, right? And the next step that I have written down here for myself is that I need to look for opportunities to bless other people in the church with what God has given me, be it spiritually, relationally, or materially, right? And I, I really emphasize on what God's given me because that will get rid of a really common excuse for a lot of us, which is, you know, um, oh, I, because I can't meet all of that person's needs, therefore, I'm not even going to try to meet any of their needs. Or because I can't meet that need as well as I think somebody else could meet it, therefore, I'm not even going to try, right? And, and we have to constantly remember that God is not calling us to do what he's called other people to do. He's not calling us to do things according to what he's giving other people. He's calling us to do things according to what he's giving me, Right? He's calling you to do things for the people according to what he's giving you. So the question is, in what ways can you meet the needs of the people around you? And then do it. Don't worry about if you can't meet all of their needs. Can you meet any of them? Meet those needs. And don't use the fact that you can't do everything as an excuse to do nothing. Uh, so that's, that's the way that I see like applying and really being a next step in for, for me in my life. And maybe that's helpful for you as you're thinking uh, through this passage. So uh, before we close up, I want to give you something to pray about today and this week. And then I want to give you a question to really kind of dig down and consider and contemplate this week and really talk to God about this question. So uh, first, I just encourage you to pray that God would draw your heart towards others in the church, right? Really, that God would draw all of our hearts towards one another so that our love and care testify to the truth of the gospel. You know, in the scriptures, Jesus said that people would believe in him when they saw us in the church loving each other, right? And so uh, there's, a, there's a deep truth that we have to dig into there. And so let's be praying today and this week that God would... God would help us do that. He would draw our hearts. Now, some of that's going to be work that we have to do, and part of that's going to be the Holy Spirit drawing our hearts together. So let's pray that way uh, so that our love for one another would really be a testimony to the truth of the message about Jesus. And then the question I've got for you to really think about this week is, what non-material issue might be holding you back from caring for others needs. And the reason I kind of qualify that question with non-material, right? Like rather than just say, you know, what issue, you know, well, what non-material issue? The reason I'm saying that is because 
the non-material or the material issues that are holding us back are often the easiest ones to think about. And therefore, they're often the issues that we tend to use as an excuse. And so in an effort to dig a little deeper, let's think beyond just material issues. Let's look at what are maybe some more internal, spiritual, personal issues that I have that are holding me back from giving to other people, right? Because if I'm using my schedule and my money and my resources as the reasons why I'm not helping other people, then I'm probably just writing myself excuses, right? Kind of, again, ties into the idea of, well, because I can't do everything, I'm not going to try to do anything. And that's really a fallacious way of thinking. And so, uh, yeah, think about this, that question this week. What non-material issue might be holding you back from caring for others? All right. Well, uh, again, hope this series is being helpful for you just as we really try and slow down and think about everything that we can learn from the book of Acts as we kind of walk verse by verse through it. Uh, I hope that you'll continue with us and I look forward to you being with us in our, uh, in our next lesson as we begin to dive into uh, chapter three of the book of Acts. Uh, in the meantime, have a great day and uh, we'll see you soon. We are so glad you have joined us today. To learn more about Hope Valley Church and get access to free resources, just go to www.hopevalley.church. There you will also find links to connect with us on Facebook and Instagram, as well as links to our podcasts now available on Apple, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please take a moment to like and subscribe so you can stay up with new videos coming out every week. Hope Valley is a church based in Winchester, Virginia that meets in homes around the region. So if you'd like to find out more about home churches, how they work, and how to locate one near you, just go to hopevalley.church/house. Thanks again for joining us and may God bless you today.